Hello everybody and welcome back to another hobby cheating video. So recently the question came up about doing some freehand. And so I thought, hey, what a great thing to hobby cheating about. Because I think a lot of people are afraid of freehand sort of as a concept. They're afraid that it's uh, very difficult or something like that. And, and really it's not. Freehand is honestly one of the easiest things to, to do and to get going with. It's just scary because you're not... Uh, you you got to go outside the lines, as it were. So I thought, let's uh, let's do a freehand example. So I've I've primed up this uh, Empire, I don't know, standard bearer guy here, handgunner. He was just somebody extra in my collection. Uh, we zenithal highlighted him, of course. You can see we've done a lot of zenithal highlighting uh, over throughout the flag. And then I quadded off the flag because I thought, while we're doing freehand, let's also talk about some other fun things you can do with your airbrush. <clears throat> and uh, and doing things like these banners. So what I did here <clears throat> is I taped off, I, I quadded off the banner just very quickly and easily with a micron pen, and then I took some Tamiya masking tape, and I just, you know, finished out those squares. You can see there, you know, so that way I protect myself from overspray. Now what I'm going to do is, since I've already got my color variation through the zenithal highlighting, I've just really thinned down... <clears throat> some red and blue paint. We're going to go for, I'm going to do it in a more classical Bretonian color scheme here of, uh, of, uh, of red and blue because, you know, I'm really a Bretonian cart. So there we go. So as usual, we've, <clears throat> we've gone about one to one with thinner there with the paint because we want it nice and thin. And we're going to make our open areas red. And we just want to make sure our tape is nice and tight against there. I know it's a spot where it's a little loose. There we go. Okay, and so now we're just going to go ahead and we're just going to do a nice thin coat of that red. So we save as much of our xenophil as we can. Remember, we can always put more paint on. It's hard to take paint off. So there we go. It's kind of pink right now. That's okay. It barely looks like we've changed the color on there. But that's where I'm going to start. You know, I don't... Ooh, Empire Man down. I'm very popular for dropping these in these videos. Okay, let's get the other side. But I have really thinned this red out, and so I am just barely rocking that trigger back. Because whenever you have very, very thinned paint, it can be easy for it to pool and for you to get overspray, and then it starts pooling up. We don't want that. Okay, so we're just rocking the trigger back the slightest amount. And there we go, we tinted that red. So now what we're going to do is we're just going to keep coating it, <clears throat> right? And by doing these thin coats, we preserve the color underneath. We don't need to slap dash it all on at once. It's okay, it's already fast, we're using an airbrush. We can, we can take a time to do two, maybe three coats, and that's fine. Nothing too tricky about it. I'm being obviously careful. You see where the tape is definitely getting hit, but hopefully I've taped enough that I'm not getting any overspray beyond that. Make sure we get the top there. Make sure we get the bottom of the side there. I'm using uh, some Vallejo Game Air Gory Red here for my red. Just a nice rich red tone that I like. You can use any red you want. Um, red is a naturally very translucent color, so it was an easy pick for this. So. So there we go. Now we've got our nice red quadrant still preserving the shading underneath. All right? I think that comes through okay. And so now what we're going to do is I'm going to uh, I'm going to pause. I'm going to take the tape off, retape over the red after it dries completely, and uh, then we'll do the blue parts. And I'll probably I might just do all that off camera because frankly it's the same process just over again. I'm going to let this dry 
tape it in reverse and turn the other side blue with some thin glue. And so I just wanted to show you this element of airbrushing with some tape to do nice little quad banners. So I'm going to finish that off and then we'll actually go over to the uh, over to the painting desk and we'll start with our freehand. Okay, so we'll pick up back at the desk. All right. Okay, so we are back at the desk and uh, our flag is all ready to go. Um, now, funny story here real quick that I'll tell. Um, important lesson about using masking tape. Uh, make sure that your paint is completely dry, which I know, but stupidly ignored to film the other part very quickly. And so when I peeled off the masking tape, I managed to take a little bit of the paint with it. So I just kind of had to redo it and ended up doing it with a brush. Whatever, it doesn't matter. We got it re-highlighted back up. No big deal. You can see we've got some nice blends there. Um, the color is getting kind of washed out because this big white thing is in the envelope is in here. And that's what we're going to talk about next. So we've got our surface ready to go. And now we want to do some freehand on it. So what's the first step to our freehand? Well, the first step to freehand has nothing to do with the miniature. We're going to set that to the side. Because our first step is right here. Our first step is on, I just grabbed an old envelope, use whatever, it doesn't matter, some piece of scratch paper, and I just started drawing stuff. Um, I Google searched like various empire heraldry and images, you know, just a little Google image search, always your best friend, and I found some stuff I thought was interesting and it was simple enough that I could draw, because I am by no means a great freehand artist, but the best part is you don't need to be. In fact, you can be pretty terrible and still do some good freehand, because one of the most key parts to a lot of freehand, especially when it comes to tattoos and things like this, is remember, these are drawn by people in world. Like, if this banner has a thing on it, it's because somebody sewed it in there or painted it on. If he's got a tattoo, that somebody put that tattoo on that person, right? It isn't like the cloth or something like that that has to be blended and you're trying to exactly capture the light. You're trying to represent something that somebody in the world created. So it's okay for it to be somewhat cartoony or stylized or something like that. Most heraldry was. Um, most heraldry, if you go back and look at historical heraldry or whatever, wasn't, you know, beautiful, uh, like, Michelangelo Sistine Chapel ceiling paintings on a banner. They were carried in battle. They were meant to be simple emblems that identified who, you know, what what was what, what, what team you were on, right? That's all. Okay. So, what I did is I just kind of sketched out, just, you know, just a pen, like literally just an ink pen. I drew out uh, some things that I liked. So, I like this little cross with the circle. I didn't, send, and here's one that I screwed up. I was like, nah, I was going to do like a fist thing, but I just didn't like how it's turning out. So, whatever, we won't use that. Who cares? That's the best part about doing it on scratch paper. If you get one you don't like, you can just say, meh, whatever. Don't, don't use that one. That's why we're doing it on scratch paper first. So, the cross with the circle, I like that. I like the skull with the... Um, sort of fronds. I think that looks cool. It's very empire-y. Um, the little twin-tailed comet, which I could probably do a little better, but uh, that's okay. I, you know, I don't know if I really need little motion lines around it or whatnot. And then a very simple sword with K and F next to it. And it probably needs to be cleaned up. Resketch them as many times as you want until you're comfortable with them. Okay? Like, you can just keep drawing it right next to each other until you're very confident in your sketch. Okay? So, that's step one. All right, so now I'm going to move this aside and get the color balance back into my image here. There we go. Okay, much brighter. So now we can see the highlights in this blue, much nicer, and the red. Okay, now I'm not going to do all eight squares here, and nor did, would you necessarily have to. We could say just do the blue squares or something, and maybe that's the appropriate choice. That's fine. Okay? Um, but that leads, for the purpose of this, I'm probably going to do one of the squares to completion just to show you what it looks like. And that leads us to the next thing. I've mentioned this very often in the PMP reviews, and uh, we'll mention it again here. And that is your Micron pen. Okay, so you can get these. There's a couple different types of these. Um, I think because with the Gundam line, they released a line that, that's very similar to this in function. Um, there's one that there's some that have more of a brush tip, things like that. I like the just sort of standard Pigma Micron 005 pin. So this is the 0.2 millimeter 
line. I doubt you can see that, but that's what that says. 005. If you go on Amazon, you can order a big pack of these for six or seven bucks, uh, and they will last you for the rest of your hobby life. Um, you will probably die before you burn through all these ink pens. So you can rest assured that your investment is a good one. Um, and what we're going to do is we're just going to draw out that image. Okay. So I had a bunch to select from there. So I'm going to actually just do, I'm going to do one that I think was fairly simple, um, from my original thing. And I'm going to just simply draw the cross with the circle. Okay. So. Um, one of the keys when you're doing this is, you notice how my wrists are resting, you probably can't see, but my wrists are resting on the desk. I'm gripping the, the, the item, I want to make sure that he's nice and well and attached, right? I'm gripping the item, and then my other hand is resting in this hand. So the only thing that's mobile here is my fingertips. The rest of my wrists are locked and tight and ready to go. So when you're doing very close-up freehand, this is true for brush painting too, this is the way you want to be doing it. You want to get your, your wrists and hands nice and locked up. So that way you have a real fine control just on your fingertips. Okay? So what I'm going to do then is take my micron pen, and I'm just going to draw that out. Now, if it's not perfect here, that's okay. One of the concerns that got mentioned in the post that made me want to do this was I'm afraid if I screw it up. I, I spent a lot of time blending. That's what the person said. And I'm afraid if I screw up the freehand, I won't be able to fix the area around it because of the blend. Okay. Uh, so let me say this. And I've been there. All right. I've been in that place where you're like, man, I just spent so much time blending that flesh. Now if I mess up that tattoo, how am I going to fix that flesh next to it? Let me let you in on a little secret. Very easily. Okay. Because the reality is, is that if you mess it up, What's going to happen? You're going to have a small amount of paint go over the edge onto an area it shouldn't be in. You know what that means? You pick the closest mid-tone of whatever's near that, and you put it over top of it. And you, it'll go away. You won't even notice. I promise. So here's an easy example I'll pick from another model here that I've been working on. My Beastman here. All right, let's see if we can get that to zoom in. There we go. You can see he's got tattoos all over his chest and whatnot. First of all, I don't know how you screw this up. If I jump with the pen or, or with the, the paintbrush when I did these and sort of the line went wonky, I would just integrate that into the design, right? So in a case of tattoos, you've really got like nothing to worry about because especially if it's just like weird symbolism like this, okay? In the case of something like this, you can see now we've drawn our cross on here, okay? If I mess it up, just take any of the blue tone that's as close to what you had and just dab over it. You will be surprised how impossible it is to notice that change. Okay? So, now, we've got our cross. What's our next step? So now we're going to need to start painting. it. And that certainly isn't perfect. Um, I can notice my cross is not... Let's see if I can get that to get rid of the reflection there. There we go. Not perfect. It's a little, little loppy-sided on one area there. That's okay. We can clean that up. So now we're going to use a very, very, like we're going to use a sh pretty sharp brush here because we want a nice fine tip. And I'm going to use a nice heavy opaque paint. Um, specifically, I'm going to use the extra opaque line from Vallejo, um, which I like for doing things like this. Um, and same thing again. We're going, to, we're going to get it there. We're going to lock our wrists up, right? And we're going to paint that. We're going to fill in the design that we've made. Okay. We're just nice, simple, short, light touches. We're not worried about doing this quickly. It'll, it's going to take the amount of time it takes. And it's such a small thing, it's not going to take long. We can also fix if there's sort of, if there's an area that we feel like we didn't balance properly, we can fix it right now. Because the fun part about the micron pen is that we can go in later and re-outline this. Okay? So, I'm just keeping my brush nice and wet. Keeping the paint smooth, getting a good even coat of it here. And we're just filling in the design that we made. 
nothing tricky. At this point, it's no different than painting a normal model. Okay? In a normal model, you're filling in whatever the sculptor left for you to fill in. Here, you're doing the same thing. You're just filling in your own lines. Okay? Now, in the case of these, the circle, I don't have an open space, so I'm just going to paint directly over my own line. Now, you'll notice I'm not painting with the final color that I'm actually going to use here. And that's purposeful, okay? Because one of the things that, can, that, that people often do with freehand is they try to just paint the final color straight onto it. And then it looks kind of sketchy and see-through and stuff like that. Instead, I used a very uh, heavy pigmented foundation paint to start. Because what I want this to be eventually is sort of an ivory white color. Okay? So I started with this very heavy, uh, this heavy paint. It's this guy right here. Uh, well, there'll be a product review coming for this line eventually. But for now, just... No, it's, it's sort of the equivalent of the old foundation paints, like I said. And I got a nice base coat down. Think of painting this just like you do with your uh, with your the rest of your miniature in that if you have a little bit of layer and tonal variation to the color it's going to look better. Okay? So what's next? Next up I'm going to take some of a darker tone than what I want. So this is a sand ivory color. Okay? I'm going to get a little bit of that on my wet palette over here. And then I'm going to get my, my sharp brush out. And now I'm going to cover over everything I just did. Once again, same position. And we're just going to turn all of that area we just printed with the base coat, which, is, which got a nice solid color. We're just going to paint all of that this ivory color. And we're going to use that as our actual shade to kind of start from. Now, usually with this, with small freehand things like this, contrast is king because you have a very small area and you need to make it pop. And so that's why it works best on nice mid-tones. That's another reason I picked this... Um, that's another reason I picked red and blue, because these nice mid-tones, can, I can use whites and blacks and things like that, and both will be stark against it, okay? So now you can see I turned it ivory there. Easy peasy. Next step done, okay? Now I want to get some of the aged white, um, some of the more brighter color. Um, what I want is my final color. Sorry, that's aged white there. And uh, we're just going to, again, put a little drop out over here on our palette. And this time I'm not going to paint quite the whole thing. I'm going to just do one side of it. Okay? So in the case of the cross, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the top and the right side to create some variation. Same thing there. I'm just going to do the top of each of the crossbars, and then I'm just going to do the very top here of the circle, and the very top there of the circle. So now what we get is something like that. But that's still really not stark enough, right? So now what we're going to do is we're going to create some contrast. And we're going to do that by just using a fairly dark brown. We're going to thin it down. You could use a really controlled sepia wash for this as well, like you could get out your seraphim sepia or something. Um, when I, I like to do gold, uh, like these things in sort of a non-metallic metal gold style often. A lot of my Bretonians are done that way. You're not actually trying to paint gold, but you're using the same sort of color spread to fake that kind of an image. And this is uh, a fun color I often use there. So, we're going to make sure this is nice and thin, okay? We don't want this, we do not want to, we're not actually trying to paint this brown. We're trying to tint 
the other side and the bottom brown. So we have some variation and some interest in the way that the light is playing with this thing. Okay. So there we go. Now we've got something that's a little more exciting. We can see that there's actually like some variation going on here. If you want to go the next step, you take a little bit of that, you mix it in with your ivory a little. We get sort of a mid-tone step, right? And we just run that right down the center line. To really just smooth that out. Okay. And then our final step if we want to take those, so the circle that's surrounding it, one of the reasons I'm not quite happy with it is because the black kind of shows around the rest of this, but disappeared off of that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back in, and I'm now I'm going to recreate that circle, but I'm going to place the line on the bottom where I painted the darker area. I'm just basically reusing the pen like a brush here. I'm going to re-edge the bottom where the, I kind of had painted over the edge of the line. If I've eroded any other lines with my paint, I can just redraw them if I want the hard line. And there we go. There it is. Nice, simple freehand on that banner. Easy peasy. Okay. And of course, we could do more. Um, we could do, you know, all the quadrants if we wanted. Um, what I'll probably do is put a couple more on here off camera so you can see what it looks like. And uh, I'll throw in a picture at the end. And you'll be, and you'll sort of see what it looks like when it all comes together with the various designs I drew. But that's basically it. It's that simple and straightforward. Um, like I said, your real key, your micron pen's a great way to get those hard lines. And then your base coat, you should use a nice thick color to get your base coat down with a very sharp brush um, and then just create some tonal variation as you paint just like you would highlight normally again it's such a small area it takes seconds right each one of those little steps took me a few seconds to do a highlight um, once your paint's out there you can do a bunch of these symbols quite fast uh, and then at the end if you need to recreate any of your lines with your micron pen because you painted over you can if you happen to get paint outside the line somewhere, no big deal. It really doesn't matter. Just find a blue or whatever, whatever happens to be, you know, find the tone closest to it. Give it a little dab to re-etch your line. I promise you, unless you're viewing it from an inch away, you will not be able to tell the difference. I don't care how good your blends are, all right? Because blends are something that happen over a large area. When you have just that small spot, it's just going to be a dab of color. As long as you pick something in the middle range of near what's around it, it will blend right in. You'll never notice the difference. Okay? Hope you enjoy, and uh, hope this is useful to you. And like I said, there'll be a picture in a second uh, with some more designs on it. Thanks for watching, as always, and we'll see you next time.